Uh, hello, everybody, um, everyone in this room, and hopefully lots of you out there in uh, the uh, virtual world. Um, I'd like to introduce Alan John, who's in the Department of Physics, PhD student, who's um, soon to be graduating, and his work is in uh, the very exciting field of dielectric metasurface optics. So um, that's what he's going to talk about today. And uh, UW is, um, the UW group that he's in is um, Arka Mujam, Mujamdar, 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 sorry about that, and uh, fantastic work, and everyone should uh, check it out on the web. Thanks. All right, thanks for the introduction, Joel. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm Alan, and I'm a physics graduate student, and I'd like to present some of the work that I've done on the design and optimization of dielectric metasurface optics, in addition to presenting some of the context that the work, my work fits into. So before I want to talk about optics, uh, before I want to talk about metasurfaces, I'd like to talk about optics in general. The first thing that comes to my mind when I think about optics are pictures. And many metasurface researchers, including myself, are very much in the business of making pictures, whether they're for human eyes like these, uh, which help me because I have bad vision to make images, or if we're interested in imaging large things that are far away, like the, using this telescope, or if we're interested in imaging small things that are relatively close using this kind of microscope in the microscope objective. So these are all some pretty nice optics and they work really well, but they've been known since like the late 1800s. And as optical researchers, we always want to push further to get better functionalities. And so uh, we're currently pushing our optical hardware in many different ways. And in my research, I want to push it in terms of miniaturization and functionality. So first, talking about miniaturization, there are a lot of applications for needing compact optical systems, including Internet of Things, uh, smartphones, LiDAR for autonomous vehicles. And then one thing that is actually really interesting is in like fundamental biological studies, where this is actually the miniscope. It's a microscope that's about the size of your fist or smaller. And it's small enough and light enough such that you can put it on a top of a mouse's head. And it can actually monitor neurons firing in vivo in real time. And that makes me a little squeamish, but it's also really cool for super research. And so another thing that we're really interested in is increasing functionality. I think a lot of people here will recognize the Kinect, which is one of the first commercial products that really pushed 3D, uh, 3D vision, or not 3D vision, 3D, uh, 3D imaging and depth sensing. And something that is also really interesting for us is this idea of passive optical computing. So here is a wavelet transform of a scene. And one of the things that we want to do is, can we think of optical elements as performing some kind of passive optical computation? This can be as simple as something like a lens that produces a Fourier transform at its focal point, or maybe something more interesting like a classifier, so something like an image recognition task. Can we make these passive optical components do these tasks without using any kind of uh, electronic power? And of course, I'm here to tell you that metasurfaces are the solution, or at least part of the solution, to all of these problems that we're facing. And so when we talk about metasurfaces, metasurfaces are actually a form of diffractive optics. When we talk about diffractive optics, what we're really concerned about is the wave nature of light. So we're no longer thinking of, of light as a ray, but we're actually thinking of it as a wave. And given that it's a wave, we have two things we can control, uh, amplitude and phase. So amplitude diffractive optics, such as these zone plates, are designed, well, this zone plate is designed to focus light at some finite distance away from it. And it functions by blocking light that doesn't interfere at the focal point or and allowing light that will interfere constructively at the focal point to pass. And it works quite well for a lot of different applications, like x-ray lenses. But uh, ultimately, if you want an efficient optical device, you really don't want to block half of your light. So, uh, metasurfaces are generally implemented as phase optical elements. So in this case, this is a diffractive phase element. It has multi-levels, and then you can see that each of these levels has a different thickness, and these thickness correspond to different discrete phase shifts that the light experiences as it passes. Yeah. Is that an actual picture? Like a... That is not a metasurface. Okay. It is but an actual it, picture. It is an actual picture. Okay. okay. Fabricated diffractive optical element. Uh, so if we want to understand diffractive optics, we want to go from refractive optics to diffractive optics. One easy way to do that is to, think of, is to consider a lens. So if we consider a lens in some wave optics picture, this uh, lens has some refractive index n, and it has some spatially varying thickness along this vertical axis, which I'll call x. Uh, 
And we can describe the phase of, a, of light with some wavelength lambda passing through this lens as some 2 pi times refractive index divided by lambda multiplied by some spatially varying thickness of the lens. And as you can see from this picture from Wikipedia, uh, we, if you have a plane wave incident from the top of the lens, the waves um, that are incident towards the center of the lens experience a larger phase delay, and they are delayed, whereas the waves the light that's incident on the edges of the lens experience a smaller phase delay, so they're allowed to advance. And this actually causes a focusing effect in the far field. So now that we understand light as a wave, we also know that from a signal's perspective, only phases between 0 and 2 pi mean anything. So we don't have to actually think about this entire lens as this entire optical element. We can cut away a bunch of the bulk. And we get something that looks something like a Fresnel lens. And this Fresnel lens performs basically the same functionality as this uh, conventional lens does, but it's not very compatible with like our conventional two-dimensional lithography practice. So if we want to do top-down lithography, we can't really make these smooth curved surfaces. So what we can do is we can discretize our element into multi-levels. So in this case, again, we have some spatially varying thickness, but now it is of a discrete nature. So each of these discrete levels, there's four of them, can implement any kind of discrete phase shift. So We've gone from a continuous curvature lens to a multi-step diffractive optical lens. And these work quite well, but it turns out that using our conventional top-down lithography practices, uh, the first one is almost impossible to make, and the second one is still very hard. If we want to do four uh, phase steps, we need to do four different steps of lithography and four steps of etching, and this gets complicated pretty quickly, because in general you want more than four phase steps. If you want like eight, you have to do eight. Um, so one way to make this these kinds of diffractive optics compatible with these like top-down lithography practices that Intel uses is you can think about a binary grading. So in this case, we're no longer achieving phase by modulating the thickness of our element. We're now achieving phase by spatially modulating the diffractive index of our element. So in this case, you can see there's this N effective that replaces the N. And now this N effective is a function of space. And you can crudely construe this to be areas where there's more material, N effective is larger, so it experiences a larger phase delay. And areas where N effective is smaller, you experience less phase delay. So uh, or N areas where there's less material, N effective is smaller, and you experience less phase delay. Yeah? Potentially stupid question. Why the gaps between them? Like the original continuous design on the left, it does have notches where the thickness is nearly zero. But on the rightmost side, you have lots of air gaps in between. Yeah, so you're talking about these air gaps. This yes. is actually not a very good picture, I guess. But in this case, these air gaps, um, if you have some spatially varying grading, uh, that has some specific phase response that you'll get from it. And if you uh, essentially just modifying the duty cycle, the bigger the air gaps are, the less material you have, and the smaller your refractive index is going to, or effective refractive index is going to be. These basically the middle image is rounded to the image on the, round, on the right. So wherever you have a quarter of a thickness, it goes rounds to zero. Oh, I see. Uh, oh, I see. It. So that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so in this, so then when we talk about diffractive optics, we also have to talk about diffraction orders. In general, if we have some kind of diffraction grading with some periodicity capital lambda and some incident light with wavelength uh, lambda is incident on this grading. As it's transmitted, it not only goes straight through, but it also gets diffracted into all these extra orders. Um, and this is true in general if your grading periodicity is greater than your operating wavelength. And if I'm making something like a lens, I really want my light to go straight through into the focal point, And all this extra light that's getting wasted is just costing me efficiency. Uh, and so this is something that we can actually solve by reducing our grading periodicity to below the operating wavelength. And in this way, uh, we can actually show that all of these higher orders of diffraction are completely suppressed. And this qualification is actually what brings us from diffractive optics specifically into metasurface optics. So these are called sub-wavelength gratings or zeroth order gratings. And uh, if we wanted to modulate the phase using these gratings, we have some, if we want some uniform phase shift, we, send, we can send some plane wave at a uniform grating, and then we will get some uniform phase shift and a uniform plane wave exiting. If we want to have some kind of spatially varying phase shift, we need to spatially modulate our grading. So in this case, the uh, thick 
or the, the duty cycle of my uh, grading has, been, has a linear ramp. And that corresponds roughly, in most cases, to a linear phase shift. And you can think of a linear phase shift as something like a beam deflector. So in the top, we have a higher effective index. And that uh, is essentially, or we have denser material, so we have a higher effective index. And that means that uh, delay is delayed more. So dielectric metasurface optics is a body of research that goes back to like the mid-90s. Um, this is one of the first works that has demonstrated a high efficiency optic, and it was made in titanium oxide all the way back in 1998. Uh, more recently, there's been work with silicon gratings. Uh, this one's from HP Labs. Uh, there's also been work using silicon cylindrical posts from Caltech, uh, some rotated titanium oxide nanofins from Harvard, uh, these gallium nitride pillars that are rotated, and also they change their duty cycle. Uh, this is from a collaboration between a university in Nanjing and Taiwan, and also a more recent, some more recent work with these like really strange-looking silicon pillars from Columbia. So all of these kind of look a little different. They're all lenses, except for the first one on the top left. Uh, but there's something that is like very consistent here, and it's that we have some kind of pure lattice. We have some regular lattice, right? Uh, in this case, uh, the one on the middle top middle is uh, a hexagonal lattice. The below it is a rectangular lattice. And so there's some kind of lattice. And on these lattice points, we put some kind of dielectric structure. And this dielectric structure has some degrees of freedom. We can be changing the radius of the pillar. We can be changing the rotation of a nano fin. Or we can be changing like the geometry of these pillars. And by changing the geometry of these pillars, we can achieve different phase shifts and, in general, also amplitude shifts. And this constitutes a large complex system that has a large number of uh, degrees of freedom that we are able to play with. And not only is it complex, but in general, these could also be coupled degrees of freedom. So it's kind of a difficult design problem. And it really, uh, what we want, we're interested in is, if we have this metasurface, how do I best implement a given optical function on a metasurface? And that question kind of boils down to, how do I best take advantage of the large numbers of degrees of freedom available to me? And just as a, a ranging number, uh, a relatively small metasurface is about 100 micron by 100 micron. And if you have a grading periodicity of around 200 na 500 nanometers, that has at least 4, to 10, 4 times 10 to the fourth degrees of freedom. So that's like if you're just changing a single parameter in each uh, unit cell. Uh, so if we want to solve the design problem, I think there's two general ways where we can think about solving a design problem. One is forward design, which is intuition-based, which I would argue is more intuition-based. Um, so from here, in forward design, we essentially uh, think about we need to calculate all the properties of the scatters that we'll use. So we'll calculate that we'll just have some lattice. We'll put some scatters on it. We'll calculate all of these individual scattering scatters and their uh, properties, so their amplitude and their phase transmission coefficients. And then we have some functionality that we want to implement. Maybe it's a lens, and we know how to implement that functionality. We know that a lens is some kind of hyperbolic or some kind of quadratic phase profile that we can implement uh, using these scatterers. And so that's something that uh, has been very successful. There's another way of doing it, and it's called uh, a complementary way is called inverse design, which I'd argue is more computationally based. In this case, we may have some functionality that we want to achieve, but we don't really have a specific phase profile distribution. We don't really know how to get there. But we can define this functionality, and we can encapsulate it in terms of some kind of figure of merit. And after we do this, after we encapsulate it in a figure of merit, we can use some kind of optimization-inspired approach to actually arrive at the distribution of scatterers that achieves our functionality. And so as far as what I'm going to cover, first I'll cover some of this work on single element metasurface optics that I've done, and also some other work. Um, then I'll go over some metasurface optical systems. So this is like two metasurfaces and more. And then I'll go over some inverse design and optimization of metasurfaces. And lastly, I'll go over some of the future work and outlook that I'm interested in. So my group uses silicon nitride for our metasurfaces primarily. And that is motivated by four major reasons. Uh, one is its high refractive index at around 2, which is by high, we mean higher than glass. Uh, two is its relatively wide band gap. It has a band gap of around 4 to 5 electron volts, which is, puts it in kind of like the UVA band. Uh, 
And on the left is a picture of a silicon nitride piece, uh, or a thin film of silicon nitride. So you can see that's actually transparent. Third it is potentially, yeah? Why is the white band gap important or useful? Uh, why is band, so materials like silicon are opaque to visible light. And if you're interested in making a metasurface that's transparent to visible light, you need to have something that has a white band gap. Does that answer the question? Yep. OK. Uh, and third, it's potentially CMOS compatible. So that means that you could potentially use Intel CMOS foundries to produce these metasurfaces or other CMOS compatible foundries. Um, in general, silicon nitride is used as a hard mask, but it's also possible to etch it. And it's capable of making these uh, uh, photonic nanostructures that require strict fabrication tolerances. So these two are pictures of a nanobeam photonic resonator and also a photonic ring resonator that were produced in our lab using our silicon nitride. And fourth, maybe most importantly, uh, it was readily available in our local clean room, and there were already etching recipes developed for it, so I didn't have to do any of that work. So now that we have our material, we need to perform a parameter search. And one way of doing this is using rigorous coupled wave analysis. This is a frequency domain method. So you send one wavelength in at this set, and it assumes that you have some unit cell that is infinitely periodic uh, in all space. And it's a Fourier domain method as well. So what happens is you split this structure into different layers. And uh, or along the, the direction of the light propagation, you split this structure into different layers. So for us, that is along the line of the thickness of the pillar. And in the in-plane, you actually expand the refractive index in a periodic set of Fourier series. And then you can solve this, and then you get your, set, you get your solution in terms of some set of Fourier modes. Um, so to begin, we start by defining some kind of unit cell. Here I've defined a square with some periodicity p, and I've placed a cylinder, cylindrical scatter with some thickness t and some diameter d in this, uh, in this unit cell. And what we do is we run our simulations, and while we're running our simulations, we keep t fixed, because that that's, that, that's how we keep our compatibility with traditional top-down lithography, but we can vary d as much as we want. So for a given periodicity, we vary d. And then after we run all, of our, run all of our simulations, we can arrive at something like this, where uh, now we can see that uh, we, this pillar has some real amplitude response and some real phase response. So in general, if we want a high efficiency metasurface, we want high near unity transmission amplitude. And that's what these parameters show in blue. And in general, if you want a metasurface that can implement any kind of arbitrary spatial pa phase pattern, you need to be able to cover 0 to 2 pi. And that's what red is. And so now that we have our parameters, this pra set of parameters on the right is actually the set of parameters that we used in all of the following silicon nitride metasurface demonstrations. Uh, we want to implement some kind of phase profile. So in forward design, we generally know which kind of phase profile we want to implement beforehand. And so we have some kind of phase profile as a function of some spatial coordinates. In this case, I chose to use circular coordinates with R and theta. Uh, we have some k wave vector, 2 pi over lambda. And this is, uh, so this is a s focusing vortex beam generator. Uh, the first term is just that of a lens with some focal length f. And then the second term is some angular momentum term that determines how many singularities there are in the phase profile. So if L equals 1, there's one singularity. If L equals 2, there's 2. And these correspond to different quantized orbital angular momentum states that you can generate. Uh, so if I just calculate this phase profile, I get something that looks like this uh, for L equals 1. And you can see that there's a discontinuity that starts from the middle, and it goes towards the left. And this is, in this is a continuous phase profile. But in general, we know that only phase values between 0 and 2 pi are physical. So we can do a mod operation, and we get this nice little vortex picture. And again, we, the, finest, uh, the finest we can sample our, our phase, uh, phase profile is at the periodicity of our lattice. So now we discretize our phase profile into the periodicity of the lattice that we calculate. So now we have some discrete blocks. And that are the size of our periodicity. And we can. What size are you using for there? Huh? What size can you get down to? Uh, so for these specific parameters, our periodicity is 400 nanometers, 440 nanometers. And then what optical function are you trying to enable with this particular phase profile? This is a vortex beam generator. It creates a little donut profile. Um, it has applications in like stead microscopy. Nice. Cool. Um, OK. And so we have our phase profile. And now we can just essentially do a one-to-one -one mapping from our phase to a diameter value. And on the right is 
what we actually get when we do this mapping. And we can simulate this in FDTD. Uh, so we can simulate scaled down structures in FDTD, which is finite difference time domains uh, simulation. On the top left, you can see like the little donut profile that this vortex beam generates. On the bottom left, you can see a cross section along the optical axis showing that the donut profile forms at around 25 micron. And on the far right is an example of a structure that uh, we simulate where the yellow is a, fractive, is a refractive index of around two and the blue is a refractive index of one. And so this shows like the meshing that FDTD does when it simulates your structure. So it doesn't actually simulate like perfect circles, but it simulates these rectangular blocks that make up circles. Just to verify, so that's the geometry at the end of the day? Yes, that's, that's what we're going to fabricate. And those yellow dots are the actual radii, like the yes. D values you were talking about. Mm -hmm. I see. So in general, we scale, we simulate very scaled down versions of these. Each, uh, each yellow blob, it, it has many, many smaller features in it, right? Each yellow blob is just a cylinder. Just one cylinder. Yeah, so if you, uh, I can show you the picture right here. So uh, it's actually not very good. But it's, each yellow blob is a single cylinder, and it has okay. some diameter. And that's essentially what we did here, is that it's consistent to that. So actually, actually, if you look at the scale, the scale is quite small in the previous diagram, is it correct? So your actual lens is very small here. In this case, this lens is about 30 micron in diameter. Okay. Uh, and that's, yeah. Well, I just have a quick question. So when you design this stuff, you said you keep the P fixed. Yeah. So you're changing the, uh, the D, right? Yes. OK. And that's the only thing you change? That is the only thing we change uh, for this like demonstration. There's been other groups that have done more with like different unit cells, and that's something we're also working on in my group. Okay. So like a larger yellow blob just means a larger D, basically. Yes. Okay. What was? Do you recall what the cell size was for the MDTD simulation? Uh, lambda over 10 n, which makes it around 25 nanometers. So it was determined by lambda, right? Yes. So. so. Okay. Uh, but that was still much smaller than the value of D you care about because the yes. shape is going to get quantized and staircased when you're yes. doing the simulations. And the, the smallest radius pillar that we fabricate is probably around 150 nanometers in diameter. Okay. So roughly seven unit cells for mm -hmm. these ones. Okay. Yeah. And so we were able, actually able to fabricate these structures. Uh, here's a lens. Uh, we can see that it, this lens was designed for 250 micron. Uh, you can see that there is some finite focal shift with this lens. That's actually because we designed this lens for uh, 632 nanometers, and we tested it with, or I tested it with, an LED that has a very large bandwidth. And so we actually ended up getting something that looks like this. Uh, there's a focal spot of the lens. It looks nice and mostly circular, very unaberrated. Uh, we also made the vortex beam generator which kind of looks like this. And then here's an example of, a phase of an intensity profile before the vortex beam focuses. And then this is an example of the vortex beam itself, where you can see the donut beam profile actually being formed. And that's still with an LED? This is still with an LED. How come you didn't use a, a, a Gan laser to see how sharp you could get it? So one thing we were interested in um, that we didn't really understand at that point when we did this research is why um, if whether, we, whether or not we needed coherent light to make these structures work. So naively, we would kind of think that if we're playing with phase, maybe we need to be playing with coherent light in order for this to work. And that was something that people hadn't really tested. So we were like, we, we should test with an LED and see what happens. Okay. Yeah, actually, yeah, I just realized. So when you're doing this optimization with FDTD, are you doing it for a single frequency? Like you're yes. mostly monochromatic for yes. all this? I see. And so these elements work quite well. Uh, we have lenses that work. They're ultra thin. They're ultra. Like, they have small focal lengths. They work kind of well. Uh, and the problem is, kind of that what you guys are hinting at is that we have very large chromatic aberrations, and these are characteristic of any kind of diffractive optic. So what ends up happening is that we design our wavelength. We design our lens for a wavelength of 632 nanometers. It focuses pretty close to there for our uh, red fo for our red mm -hmm. color, um, but we observe as much as a 50% focal length shift over our entire visible spectrum. So for blue, yeah. 
How long does that, the FDTD simulation and, and the optimization process take for something of this size? Uh, so FDTD isn't optimizing anything. It's just simulating some structure that I give it to. Um, and I would say that it takes around 20, 30 minutes. For each evaluation or for the entire optimization with multiple There's simulation? no optimization that's happening. We just do our, we, so in this process, uh, we have a phase value, and we pick a diameter that corresponds to that phase value. And then oh, we can right. simulate the structure using FDTD just as a check that oh, it will I work. Uh, we don't actually optimize an FDTD. And it's kind of impractical to optimize an FDTD. Um, but that's something cycle, yeah. I'll go over it. Kind of spit. So yeah, large chromatic aberrations, character-assisted diffractive optics, uh, not good for imaging. So if, if you're not familiar with chromatic aberrations, the picture on the top is a sharp picture that, it, that has very little chromatic aberration. The picture on the bottom is chromatically aberrated. And this is chromatic aberration associated with the refractive lens. So if a chromatic aberration associated with a diffractive lens would actually be worse than the picture on the bottom. So that's a serious problem that we want to talk, that we want to uh, correct. And so that brings me to the next topic, which is correcting chromatic aberrations. Um, so there's been a lot of work in correcting aberrations. Uh, this is a problem that the metasurface community has been very interested in over the past few years. And so and these works all came out in 2018. Um, they do kind of different things, but what they're really doing is they're doing something called dispersion engineering. So the problem of chromatic aberrations is kind of a subtle problem. Um, it doesn't exist, it doesn't result from the way that a traditional refractive optics exhibits chromatic aberration, which is some kind of anomalous dispersion in your refractive index. This is actually a product of the way that we wrap our phase. So when we do this mod operation of mod 2 pi, uh, for the wavelength of interest that we mod, that we wrap, it wraps correctly. But for other wavelengths, uh, we actually might wrap too early, or we might actually wrap too late. And this actually causes the chromatic aberration. And there's some associated phase error with this wrapping operation that we perform. And you can actually attempt to correct with, for this phase error, and this is what these groups have done. And you can see on the top left that they get some nice focal lengths or, or nice focal spots that are all kind of in the same area um, for this lens. Uh, but you can also see that it's kind of a very extended focus, and these are very low numerical aperture lenses. Um, and on the bottom, you can see that these are some of the devices that they've kind of or the structures that they've kind of engineered to perform this dispersion engineering structure, dispersion engineering. Uh, so there are limits to this technique of dispersion engineering. Yeah. What, uh, what's the intuition for why some of these structures might help to reduce chromatic? So you can think of these as like waveguides. Okay. And for different waveguides, we have different effective indices that determine how these different wavelengths propagate. So there's cer a certain set of a different allowed modes mm -hmm. that uh, are allowed by these waveguides, and they all have different refractive indices, and they will de they will delay different wavelengths by different amounts. So if you build a very large library of these waveguides, yeah. and then you have a very large number of different delays, you can think about just like optimizing your, or doing some kind of, using your lookup table to pick out um, if red light needs some specific delay to match up with the green light, can I find a pillar that gives me that delay? Got it. And then these sorts of like uh, rectangular structures, then orientation, I mean, they probably have an increased parameter space in terms of orientation, height, uh, or is it? As you say, like a library, I mean, there's just these fives that they're, that they're modifying. So there's these, so that in this paper in the below, uh, they have three generations. Um, the third, the, the one on the bottom, uh, they have five like primitive unit cells, right. and they can modulate the size of like the whole of this unit cell or like the thickness of like this. Okay. So they can make the pillar on the far left bigger or smaller. They can make the hole in the, a pillar in the middle left kind of bigger or smaller and, or the pillar itself. And you can kind of see that from what they've done there. Right, got it. Yeah. So each one of these uh, delays a, a different wavelength, uh, a different amount, has a different phase shift. Mm -hmm. And then uh, how, how does that work? When you put them together, uh, isn't there still some light that's going through the wrong kind of these things that's getting the wrong delay? How does just that pillar provide the phase shift for, say, red light? and none of the other pillars that are, are tuned for green light, the red light doesn't go through those, or is it some weird coupling between these things? Uh, so uh, first, they don't actually, nobody uh, in forward design actually accounts for any kind of coupling between the pillars, which is one of the problems with this body of research. 
Uh, but in terms of how they know, what they've done is they ha basically calculate all of the modes for all of these pillars, for all the interest wavelengths they're interested in. So let's say phase pillar 1 gives you f phase shift for red, phase shift for blue, and phase shift for green. And you know that in order to implement a, a perfect lens, uh, your red phase shift needs to be some certain function, your blue phase shift needs to be some certain function, and your green uh, phase needs to be some certain function. You can if you have a large enough library of pillars, you can choose the correct pillars that will always produce those phases. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. You choose a combination that yeah. gives you the phase shift that you want. Right. OK. So it, this comes to a, this is basically a matter of like how many parameter freedom, degrees of freedom do I have to basically get these different modes to get these different phase shifts. Uh, and there's a limitation to it. And it actually is limited by the height of your pillars. So these different modes have different refract effective refractive indices. Um, but just having a different refra effective refractive index isn't enough. Um, if, you, if you want to have a finite phase shift, you also need to have a thickness. And what ends up happening is that if you is, uh, this limitation is kind of defined by this equation. Uh, but what, essentially what it is is if you want to have a numerical aperture uh, or as some certain radius, you are limited by the total delta phase shift between these that you can achieve. So delta is like the compensation that if you're designing for green, you can compensate delta for red or blue. And what this basically says is that if you want a high numerical aperture lens, in order to do so, you have to make very, very tall pillars, or else you have to make a very, very small radius lens. So uh, for, these, for this group right here, what they've done is they have these 800 nanometer pillars and these 1400 nanometer pillars. And you can see that the effective phase shifts that they get don't actually correspond to much larger uh, performance, or like much better performance. Uh, so this is something that uh, my lab was interested in solving in a different way. And we came at it from a computational imaging approach. So in this case, we wanted to find some phase profile. In this case, we have a phase profile of just an ordinary hyperbolic lens. And we add, that, we add to that a cubic function. Um, and this cubic function ha serves the function of uh, creating an airy beam, which is a diffraction invariant beam. And so as stated before, if, we, if alpha is equal to 0, we just get a lens. And at the focal plane of the lens, if we design our lens for green, we have a nice tight focal spot. But the, there's a significant blur in blue and red. right? But by making alpha some finite value, we create a roughly propagation invariant beam. So we can see that at our focal point now, instead of having um, a nice point for red, we have an L shape for all of these different uh, an L-shaped point spread function for all of these different colors. And they look really ugly. And if you, you know that imaging is the convolution of your object with your point spread function. But even though they look really ugly, they all look fairly similar. And so then that means that we can use a single filter, essentially, to, de de to perform a deconvolution operation. And maybe you can retrieve the actual image back. So this is some very basic wave. Yeah? Because of this point spread function, that filter is separable? Or Yes. Acceptable, so it's fast. Yes. No, we don't actually use that property of it. We just use a Wiener filter because I'm not a computational imaging guy, and we, this is kind of our first work. Uh, but this is um, work that was from like the early 19, early 90s, uh, from Edward Dowski's group, uh, not Edward, from Edward Dowski and H. Watch, and they basically laid the foundation for this work. And what we've done was essentially we've combined the two elements into one, and we've uh, demonstrated that they can actually work with diffractive optical and diffractive optical elements as well. So, so for some experimental results, if we have, we can make a singlet. This is just a singlet metasurface lens. Uh, you can see that's symmetric axially. Um, this is what an EDOF lo lens looks like. It looks kind of similar, but you can see that on the top and on the left, yeah, on the left, uh, you get this L shape that appears. And that's due to the cubic functions that we're adding to it. And so these are some of the imaging performance in color. So in this case, uh, we have some ground truth image on the far left, uh, RGB, some rainbows, and a, nat a relatively natural scene. Um, when image with the megasurface singlet, we get uh, so the singlet is designed for green wavelength. We get a very nice sharp green, but every other wavelength is kind of blurred. Uh, 
on the middle right, we have the raw EDOF image. And there we can see that all of the images are relatively blurred at using by this L-shaped point spread function. And on the very far right uh, what we, is the filtered image. So what we've done is we've just used a Wiener filter. Um, and we can see that from, at least for the RGB, the R and G and B are better defined compared to the singlet. Uh, for Roy G. Biv, there are, the yellow is noticeably better, um, but there's still these like L artifacts, and these we attribute to essentially calib the calibration of our system, and also uh, the use of our we just use a Wiener filter, um, so that also comes with some noise amplification as well. The images yeah. are also just darker. Does that represent something like the efficiency of the system or something like that? Uh, yes, the fish. The efficiency of this particular system was a little bit lower than that of the singlet lens. Uh, but it has a more uniform efficiency over the bandwidth because the singlet is more efficient for green. Yes? Is, is there a contrast problem here? Is some, is some light not being focused by the lens? Is that way there isn't high contrast on the right? Uh, so some of the light's not being focused by the lens? I'm just wondering because if the lens is less efficient, you could just take a longer exposure, right? You can pass more light yeah. through. So, so why is there so little contrast on the very rightmost images compared to the original images? Is that because you have light leakage that's you know, light that's not being focused? It's yeah. giving you like a background. So these metasurfaces are around 40% efficient, and they're they focus around 40% of the light that is transmitted uh, into this airy beam spot. And that's kind of a rough estimate of how efficient our lenses are. So then the other 60% just gets spread across the whole Yeah, surface. it gets kind of spread across. Um, not necessarily, some, some, of it, some of it definitely gets rejected into the sidebands, and that's the most notable source of loss that we've noticed, is that um, what we see is that we see, uh, I think this is due to a sampling issue that we have, is that uh, we, we're not, we don't sample fine enough. We actually create different face profiles called just based on aliasing. And these kind of aliasing effects kind of eject light into the side bands sometimes. Um, I'm also not the best experimentalist. And this is some work that we collaborate, I collaborated with Shane on. And Shane is the first author. And kind of like very interesting stuff. Uh, so. These are all single metasurface works, and I've covered some of like color chromatic imaging. There's a lot of other stuff that's being done. Um, so there's holography, polarization optics, nonlinear optics, and some review articles. And uh, yeah, so there's some cool stuff that's being done in a lot of different fields. And so next, I will cover something called, uh, t like towards metasurface optical systems. So this is like two op metasurfaces together in tandem. So one thing that we demonstrated uh, was an Alvarez lens. So for those of you unfamiliar with it, it's two face plates that are obey this, these cubic functions. Uh, when they are aligned, they have no function. They have they provide no optical power. But for some finite displacement in the extra in along the x dimension uh, that we call d, we get a tunable focal length, and it is, and so the power is related to one over the focal length. So this, the power goes up linearly with the uh, displacement. And we can kind of simulate how these work using some naive wave optic simulations. So for small displacements, we get a long focal length. And for large displacements, we get a short focal length. Uh, of course, we experimentally tested these. Uh, we fabricated these in our clean room. Oh, well. Uh, and so we have our fabrication has gotten better in the time pan. And we've noticed, and we get around uh, three millimeters of total tunable focal length across 100 micron of physical displacement, uh, where 50 micron is a displacement in one direction, and each of the plates is displaced 50 micron. So it's 100 microns of physical displacement. And in this case, this focal length change corresponds to an optical power change of around 1,600 1, diopters. Uh, there's other tunable systems that are more monolithic that have been demonstrated more recently. In this case, there's a polymer lens that they use MEMS to stretch. Um, and also a uh, pretty interesting like doublet that is formed. And they can change the distance between these two doublets, or these two lenses, to create a tunable focal length lens. Um, and yeah, so in this case, they have a monolithic system. And they use these MEMS devices to actuate. But what actually ends up happening is that uh, 
they require very high voltages on the order of 60 to 100 volts to operate these. And also, their relative tunable focal lengths and their relative optical powers are a little bit lower than that of the Alvarez lens. How, how big are these lenses? Uh, the red scale bar is about 100 micron, and the white scale bar is about 20 micron. So this one's probably around like 400 micron in diameter, the bottom one, and the top one um, is relatively large. And so in addition to tunable optical systems, there's also systems for angular incidence. And the group at Caltech has been very prolific in uh, making these systems. And uh, what they've shown is they've shown metasurface retroreflectors, which have applications in optical communications and such. And also a uh, really interesting angular aberration correction. Because uh, as these metasurface lenses are generally designed for straight on illumination, they have a kind of a small field of view. And so they've, what they showed is that by fabricating another metasurface, they can correct angle aberrations up, of, up to around 20 degrees, having a nice focal spot. And something that our lab has also demonstrated is large area design. So we always claim that these metasurfaces are compatible with uh, conventional photolithography, and this is something that we actually implemented. Um, and in this case, what we've shown are these uh, large area Alvarez lenses. Uh, in this case, they're about a centimeter by a centimeter. And uh, there's, uh, we can perform some varifocal imaging. And here at the bottom is a group work done by uh, the group at Harvard that also has done something similar. And they also have a centimeter by centimeter lenses. So these optical elements are compatible with uh, traditional lithography. And you can actually make them quite big and quite easily using photolithography. Uh, so now I'd like to go over some of the work that I've done in the inverse design of these optical elements. So again, we have this design problem. We can use forward design, which is more intuition-based, or we can use inverse design, which is more computationally based and more of an optimization-inspired method. And that's what I'll be talking about. So it's formulated as an optimization problem. Um, mathematically, if we're given some figure of merit, f of x, where x is a function of some set of parameters p, uh, we want to minimize f of x uh, while constraining x to solve some kind of linear system of equations, ax equals y. So for a physical representation, f might be some kind of intensity distribution that we want to achieve in the far field. x might be the electrical electric field that the fig fi figure of merit is expressed as a function of. And p might be the radius of our cylinders, or it might be the dielectric permittivity of our system. So while we can't change x directly, we can change p. And by changing p, we can get x. And that's what AX equals Y is. It's kind of like the physics of the, the, physics of the uh, system. And in general, uh, we use a gradient-based solution to do this. And so here's kind of a layout of the optimization procedure. We start with some initial condition. We solve our forward problem. We calculate a figure of merit. We solve our inverse problem. And then we calculate our gradient. And we update continuously until our figure of merit reaches some kind of exit condition. So this is a field that has been growing in popularity in the nanophotonics community. Um, however, uh, well, so they, one of the first demonstrations that caught a lot of attention was this wavelength demultiplexer. So what happens is you have two wavelengths incident from the top left. And those wavelengths are split and t uh, split into these other two waveguides. So one wavelength, wavelength, one wavelength goes into the top waveguide, and one wavelength goes to the bottom waveguide. Uh, in addition, we also have some demonstrations of two-dimensional metasurface lenses. So what this has actually done in, the, I think, the radio or microwave band. And they've shown a high numerical aperture lens and also a more normal lens. And these are two-dimensional lenses, so they focus light into a line, or also known as cylindrical lenses. And here's a group work uh, showing two devices. One is a high-angle beam deflector, and one is a wavelength, wavelength demultiplexer in free space. So what they've done is they have these unit cells that they tile. And they design a, a space of around 2 micron by 2 micron by 2 micron. Um, so what you notice about these inverse design demonstrations is that they all tend to be either limited to small volumes or two-dimensional designs. So the first one is like a 2 micron by 2 micron by a few hundred nanometers area that they're designing. Um, the bottom left is some kind of two-dimensional design. And on the right, they have, they're designing some kind of periodic unit cell that they tile on a larger area. So while these methods all result into different kinds of structures, they all rely on 
the same underlying method, and it's a finite difference method. And so we can solve these finite difference methods in the time domain, in which we start with some kind of initial field, and we propagate it through using Maxwell's equations or uh, using Faraday's law or Ampere and Ampere's law. Or we can solve it in the frequency domain, where now we're solving the vector wave equation, and we can form an equation that's kind of like ax equals b using this uh, wave equation. Uh, but the issue is that because we're meshing uh, all of our design space into finite volumes, the memory scales with the volume of the system. So for large systems, this scales uh, poorly, and it becomes very untenable very quickly. So how do we get to large-scale optimization? There's two main challenges that we have to overcome. One is we need a fast and memory efficient simulation method. We can't use a finite difference method for a large volume without doing some kind of tricks because it just takes up too much memory and it becomes too slow. And we need to run a lot of iterations, so it also needs to be fast. Uh, and two, we also need to faithfully simulate, numerically simulate the system. Uh, so in this case, we want to be able to capture all of the electromagnets of the, sy of the system to be able to have the most robust optimization method possible and take advantage of all the physics that we can. So, the idea is that we had was to achieve both with an analytical scattering theory, and this is actually uh, called the generalized multi-sphere mean method. And so what we gain from uh, this is we gain an analytical theory. So in this case, we have a scattering theory that is exact. Uh, we can calculate the inner particle couplings exactly. Uh, it's, all of these scattering functions are easily computed mathematical functions, so we can actually calculate them very quickly instead of storing finite difference matrices, so our memory usage is also lower. What we lose is we lose our flexibility in designing arbitrary scatters. So while the groups before were able to make these arbitrary scatters, now we're restricted to spherical scatters. So what we're doing is we're optimizing arrays of spheres and we're changing their radii to achieve some kind of optical function. And we'll show that we can actually do some quite some cool things with this. And this method is also easily extended into scatters of larger dimensions. So spheres are three-dimensional, though? Yes. So this is a three-dimensional method. OK. We're Thank optimizing. You. Yeah. I guess we'll probably talk about how you reduce that to your two-dimensional two fabrication. If it's a, or you we just step case it. We use the nanoscribe. OK. Uh, yeah. So the forward method is also already implemented uh, by a group from KIT called CELES. And it solves this matrix system of equations. It's a linear system of equations. Um, I was able to contribute a little bit to this by uh, implementing, uh, allowing this system to, allowing this code to solve spheres of different radii. So before it was just spheres of the same radii. And it's been proven to be able to solve systems with spheres numbering up to around uh, 100,000. So it is relatively large scale. We can simulate large three dimensional distributions of spheres with this code. And that was a good place to start. And so one, we now we needed to find an application. One thing that was really interesting to me was depth sensing. Um, so we were, I was really inspired by this paper where they have some point spread function that varies as a function of defocus. So these two lobes rotate in space as, uh, these two lobes rotate in space as you defocus the system. And you're able, if you're able to accurately characterize the rotation of the space, um, different images at different def values of defocus will be convolved with different point spread functions. And then if you can deconvolve them, you, you can get some kind of depth map. And then they can do it actually re with very high resolution. And so we want to do something similar. Uh, but instead of doing like a continuous rotate, two, lo ro two rotating lobes, uh, I chose to have one focal spot that rotates around uh, for different values of defocus. And it uh, rotates in a discrete heli helical pattern with just uh, with eight fo focal planes. So at our fo first focal plane, um, I want to focus light at the yellow point. And I want to minimize the light intensity that goes to the blue point. And that's because that blue point is the location of the next focal plane. So at the next focal plane, which is at 120 micron, uh, the focal point moves counterclockwise. And now I want to maximize again intensity at the yellow point and minimize intensity at, the, at these two blue points. And then at the next focal point, I do the same thing. And at the end, I get something that looks kind of something like this. Uh, and this function can be roughly described by this figure of merit, where I set some non-zero intensity at yellow. So I want to maximize my intensity there. And I set i blue equal to 0, so I want to minimize my intensity there. Um, so I put this into that method, and out comes an array of spheres. This sphere is about this array is about 150 micron by 150 micron, um, and it looks pretty useless to me on first look. But uh, it's just a ran it looks like a more or less random array of spheres. But so we tested in simulation, 
And then we actually see that at these focal planes, we get this nice little spot that rotates around uh, as we defocus the system. And so now we actually need to make these structures. Um, it turns out that you can actually make spheres if you use a Nanoscribe 3D printer. So the Nanoscribe is a 3D printer that works using two-photon lithography. So essentially how it works is you have some kind of polymer. Um, this polymer can be denatured by light of a certain intensity. So what you do is you focus um, your a laser, a pulse laser beam. And at the areas where the pulse laser beam is intense enough, you get polymerization and you get something that sticks. Everywhere else, you can just wash off after you've done exposing your suit. So they can get these really cool, uh, relatively high resolution three-dimensional structures. This um, is also a high band gap material, and this is a, is it a polymer? This is like a UV epoxy. Okay. So it is, it's hard to define band gap for something like yeah. a polymer, but it is transparent to visible light. Could, could you model uh, the cylinders we had before with two or three or four spheres on top of each other or next to each other? Cylinders? Uh, it turns out that that's not a very good way because the spheres have near field interactions that are not present in cylinders. Okay. Um, you can ex so I will, I will talk about how you can extend this method into uh, uh, accepting different geometries, and it will it, with some modifications. It can accept ellipsoids or like cylinders, and so we actually ended up fabricating it. It looks kind of similar on the top-down view uh, to what we actually wanted, but on the right, it's uh, you can see that the spheres aren't quite spherical, but they look kind of like layers of pancakes of different radii stacked on top of each other. But we might as well test it. And so for reference, here are the simulation results again. And then here are the experimental results. So we observe a higher noise floor. And this is a device was designed for 1550 nanometers. Part of the noise floor comes from dark counts from our uh, camera, which is not very good. In addition, there's very noticeable fabrication defects that we saw in the previous slide. But, but uh, ignoring all of that, we do see that we have this very high intensity focal spot that's rotating around in the same direction and in the roughly the same locations. And we can kind of characterize this. Um, so in simulation, we can, we can compare the simulation spot location with the experiment spot location. And we see besides the first and the last focal spot, they actually might quite match up quite well. Um, and most of them have an error, error of under one micron, though the first spot has an error that's a little bit above one micron. And that's kind of can be accounted for by some kind of finite amount of translational error or some kind of fitting error. Well, not fitting error, because I didn't fit the peaks. Um, and so now I want to kind of go into like some of the future work and outlook where I think, yeah? Can I ask a question? So the 3D printed structure you had also had these uh, connective lines between the spheres, right? Uh, if you go back a bit, like the example you have here that's printed in the so bottom right. If you want a big array of spheres, uh -huh. or if you want a three-dimensional distribution of spheres, then they will need some support. Right. But in my case, I didn't need to do that. Oh, you didn't? No. So in this case, uh, the spheres are independent of each other. Uh, they're just on a glass substrate. Are they half spheres or are they full spheres? <laughs> they're full spheres. Sorry. I oh, okay. That. okay. That's a, yeah. So okay. this, the top right picture is kind of an angled view, and it doesn't really show how fully, the full sphere Spherical part, but you can kind of see it a little bit, maybe. But yeah. When, when, I mean, maybe this would be hard to get, but when looking from not top down, I mean, were you able to observe a uh, greater um, sort of uh, uh, irregularities in the spheres? Because, I mean, when you're looking top down, right, you could, yeah, this might right. be, I'm assuming that the printer is, is sort of printing along with parallel to the substrate and layers parallel to the substrate, right? And uh, yeah. so, like, when you're looking from the others, from a perspective that's maybe, you know, a cross-section of this, the spheres will look like more like half spheres or something. So uh, yeah, that might be true. Uh, but what the, the printer does is it doesn't actually print any material. It selectively it polymerizes, right? So you have a focal spot that's like a pixel that you okay. scan over your uh, resist. Yeah. And so I don't see any reason why they would be less spherical on the top than they would be on the bottom because it just is a focal spot that's scanning. Sure. Um, there might be some kind of mechanical issue uh, with looks, the resist. You would still imagine it is focusing layer by layer, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you won't even get visibility into certain spots and things like that. So there is a preferred direction here in which it's going. So 
I guess what you're saying is top down you can see nice discs still yeah. but sideways when you look at it you might see some other shape issues. I would expect mechanical issues actually. So there might be mechanical issues but they are, there's been groups that have been actually able to make these kinds of structures, right? So like mm -hmm. while there might be mechanical issues with larger three-dimensional arrays of spheres, I wouldn't actually expect it with what I'm doing just because they have some really nice results. And mm -hmm. this is uh, epoxy, is basically SU8, which has relatively well-studied mechanical properties, and it is capable of producing a very high aspect ratio, like uh, picture. So you can, you, can you can make little spheres that are balanced on a <coughs> without having them roll around or anything. Uh, with some trial and error, yes. Okay. So there is, so when I make these spheres, there is like a little bit of a cut <coughs> of a little bit of like a flat surface, because I mm -hmm. kind of kind of so have to sit a little bit. The spheres in the bottom here. Yeah. This, yeah. yeah. And I have had these samples like flow, fly off when I like try to rinse them off with something, and they'll just like float up and I'll. <laughs> it's okay. It's like twenty minutes of work, so it's like not that bad. And that's another ex benefit. Can you go back one slide. Yeah. Oh, maybe it was. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so these are actually pretty big spheres, right? Can, these are. This is for visible light. This is a, uh, okay, so yeah, I forgot to mention this is for infrared light. Infrared light. So the resolution of the nanoscribe is roughly 200, 200 by 200 by 700 nanometers. So that's like your smallest dimension that you could do. Mm -hmm. And so the smallest spheres that you could reliably make spherical, they quoted as around 100 micron or 1 micron in diameter. Uh, so we decided to use infrared light because we couldn't actually resolve the small enough. And as a caveat, this actually isn't a metasurface per se because the periodicity is actually greater than the wavelength. Mm -hmm. This is a pure diffractive. What? This is like a pure diffractive. Yeah. Thing, so. But the simulation oh. method doesn't really change. It's more just like the fabrication that we forced us to kind of make these bigger structures. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, not sure, sure. I'm not sure if there's a term for yeah, this. I would not call this a pure diffractive. <laughs> Maxwell doesn't care whether, you know, the precise <laughs> thing, just, uh, <laughs> what labels we put on it. Yeah. 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 And so kind of the outwork. Uh, so we can extend this method to arbitrary shapes using something called the T-matrix method. This is a method that was actually developed mostly for use by astronomers or astrophysicists who want to study like space dust um, and like part of and aerosol particles. Um, so this extension is something that I've been working on and we've actually been able to implement it in the code. We don't have any preliminary results quite yet. Well, we have some preliminary, we don't have any like publishable results quite yet. But we have shown that we can increase the efficiency of a lens with a numerical aperture of around 0.83 uh, from 20% using tw to 26% using these ellipsoidal scatters. So in this case, it wasn't an inverse design method. We have some existing lens design that we made, and then we optimized it using this method. And we ha were able to see a pretty significant efficiency increase, in my opinion. Now, in, in these types of designs, where does that 80% of the light go? Is it just scattered uniformly across the image field? Or? So the only thing about ellipsoids is that they actually, it, it, um, there's actually a lot of backscattering. So a lot of ellipsoids will actually reflect light back at you. And that's something that I learned very recently when I was trying to figure out these intensities. Um, so in this case, some of the light is being backscattered, and some of, these, some of this light isn't being focused into the focal point. But it's a pretty commonly accepted, I think, problem for high numerical aperture lenses to focus light with high efficiency. Um, just based on like Fresnel's equations, as you as your light is incident on larger angles, it starts being less efficient, um, ba based on the the theta term. I think what Brian is implying is that if you are scattering the light into where your image is in a random or pseudo random way, that you're, yeah. you're lowering your contrast and therefore your image quality. Yeah. So where if it goes backwards, maybe that's a different problem, but. Efficiency, but maybe it doesn't affect your image quality. Uh, in this case, I think it probably would. At least there would definitely be light that would be scattered into a random background, but I think that would be true of any kind of refractive high NA lens as well. Not with coatings. Uh, do you think you could do a? a if you looked at using these, since they're good at reflecting, re retroreflecting or reflecting. If you looked at using these more as little 
mirrors than little lenses? Uh, that's something that the other grad student that's taking over this project is interested in. Um, that was not something that I, that I thought of. Okay. Uh, so maybe more in the future, like the idea of like kind of designer optics, because right now the model for an optical element is you go to a website like Sora Labs or Edmund Optics and you buy an optical element off the shelf. Like the, if you want some kind of A-sphere, they can maybe make it for you. Or if you want some kind of special coating on your lens, they can do that for you. But if you wanted some kind of really weird optical element, they probably wouldn't be able to make it for you. And I think that's largely due to manufacturing reasons. Um, so metasurfaces are already compatible with these like top-down lithography practices. So maybe there's like a new model where you can actually have some kind of design that you give to some company, and then they can fabricate this optical element for you. And now you can have these custom optical elements that are designed with your sensor to work with your sensor instead of using off-the-shelf components. Another really interesting uh, application is towards volume optics. So metasurfaces are these 2D arrays of scatters. Um, and when we think about optics, we always think about some kind of 2D input plane and it's incident on some kind of 2D surface, and that focuses on some kind of 2D output plane, like a lens. Um, but there's no reason that has to be the case. If we have some extended optical element, we can think about light entering from different ways, like some kind of like cube. Um, and that's something that has been done uh, with very low contrast glass. Uh, so what they do is they focus a laser beam on glass, and then at high intensities, this glass can get small refractive index changes on the order of like 0 0.001 or so. But even with this really small refractive index contrast and this really weak scattering, they can show that they can actually multiplex different functions or different holograms in addition to with, with respect to angle and also with respect to wavelength. And that's something I'm really interested in uh, working with because I think inverse design really shines in this situation where we have to design some kind of three-dimensional volume. And in that case, I don't think that it's very practical to make some kind of forward design. Do you, do you think that this would be, this type of design would work well with the, um, the liquid crystal, the helical uh, types of um, geometric phase that Imagine Optics does, for example? So they, the, the very phase optics? That, yeah. Uh, and what context? So, I mean, they have this nice technology where they basically have these uh, helical LCs that can make geometric phase optics similar to the metamaterial probes right. you use, but they're actually higher, more efficient, maybe slightly more mature technology. Can you apply your types of uh, design techniques to their... Uh, so these are helical materials? scatterers? These or? are helical liquid crystal. I can, I can show you later if you're not familiar with it. You should definitely check so it like out. So it's a corkscrew? Yeah, they're like cork, corkscrew liquid crystal. So they work with left, left and right hand circular polarization. Right. So they get the geometric phase a different way than, than you do with these uh, thing room. Uh, so in this case, it'd be polarization sensitive, right? Yes, very. Oh, OK. Uh, I think that would be, it would be possible to like ar arrange them. Um, you would have to find some parameterization of this corkscrew structure. and. It, that's how you'd, and then be able to like, so if this corkscrew structure has some kind of height, it has some kind of winding number, and it has some kind of uh, radius. Mm -hmm. And then if you were able to express the surface in terms of those parameters, you could probably plug it into my code and then optimize those parameters. Um, I think it's kind of hard to parameterize a helical surface. Well, I'm yeah, not, it's not something I have very much experience with. I think um, they uh, basically selectively blast away. So they're actually they're changing the rotation angle, right? I think they, don't they or the blast away. Um, or no. so how did they get they get their different phases by changing the orientation of their helix, like the rotation of their helix? I, th I think that the helix is if, if you have the if if your this device is like that, the helix goes like this. So it's the axis of the helix is parallel to your substrate. Mm -hmm. I think it's perpendicular. Uh, when, yeah, when we're dealing with like these right-hand circular polarized light, um, you can think of these helices as essentially being like polarization converters. And essentially, yeah. it's like some, the Berry phase is like your phase change is tied to the rotation of your polarization of yeah. your light. Um, and so it makes sense for it to be like the axis is perpendicular to your substrate. I, I think even if you have a, um, even if, it goes, if the axis is goes horizontal with the plane, if you look on the vertical, you still, still see another helix, helix. Because if you think, maybe, but that's, if, if I think think, that yeah. I think they designed these things with their, with their perpendicular. Yeah. 
I think other people might have done that for more diffract straight diffractive design, what you're talking about. And so, yeah. so I have another question. When you design, for example, like in the future, if you want to design these kind of 3D volume optics, um, do you have to worry about like the fact that light is being multiply scattered within um, the optics? And right. you have to like model that somehow, right? Yeah, so that's a really good point is that, you know, like uh, if you have these scatters, they have to be coupled together. And that's something that main theory actually does for us very well is that it, ca it computes all these particle particle couplings analytically. Assuming, um, assuming spherical elements. Assuming spherical, okay. but okay. The, the formalism is the same if you have different scatters of different geometries. Uh, the only thing that you have to run into is that uh, with me theory, um, if you have very closely packed particles, so if they're like, um, if you have very closely packed particles, there's another extension that you need to add because uh, if your, so your particle has some kind of circumscribing sphere, and that circumscribing sphere can't intersect with the boundary of another particle. And that is due to some uh, singularities in the Bessel functions that you use to expand your Bessel. Your, and you can fix that in different ways, but that is something you have to be more careful about. And then the last thing is some ideas that one of my, my advisor had is like the comp optics and computational algorithm co-optimization. So if we have some kind of scene or we have some kind of feature that we are interested in, uh, maybe we want to have a create an image of the scene, or maybe we want to make some kind of decision. So we can think of having the computational design of a metasurface or of a stack of metasurfaces together that perform some kind of optical function. In this case, it can be trying to image it, in which case the metasurface applies some kind of blur, or it can be performing some kind of uh, uh, mathematical operation, some kind of linear oper uh, some kind of linear operation on this uh, scene, and having some post-processing software afterwards. So this is kind of like an imaging pipeline. Um, but in practice, what has been done is that these two, pro, pro, uh, these two elements of this are, these two components, the post-processing software and the computational design, are kind of optimized independently. And so one thing that we're interested in is essentially like this co-optimization of these uh, metasurfaces with some kind of optimization algorithm. And that's something that metasurfaces really make possible because now you, can, you really have a lot of control over your Phase profiles over your scattering properties. Uh, and just a note over you, I went over some single element metasurfaces. I went over some metasurface optical systems, uh, some work on the inverse design of metasurfaces, and some acknowledgments. I'm from the Noise Lab, the Nano Optoelectronic Integrated Systems Engineering Lab. Um, ARCA is on the top left. And then I want to thank some of the collaborators. Uh, there's from left to right is Taylor, Shane, uh, Chris, uh, James and Max, and also some collaborators at the Air Force Research Lab who helped us with the inverse design project, um, the developers of CLAs, and some of the funding sources from our lab. Yeah. So these, these kinds of metasurface lenses seem to have problems with um, dispersion, efficiency, angular dependence. What do you see as the the future prospect of addressing those those issues. Can, do you think in the next 10 or 20 years we'll see a flat metasurface lens that could rival a conventional refractive lens, or are these devices going to be more more specialized, like where you need some exotic control over the the, the wavefront? And these other issues are, are not important. Like you always know the light is coming from a certain angle. You know the wavelength and, and so forth. Yeah, so that's a good point. Is that uh, it seems like there's a lot of problems right now. Uh, but one thing is that the, all of these problems have been solved relatively independently. So we have achromatic operation that works for these small numerical apertures. We have these angular corrected lenses. Um, I don't see them in the near future replacing the lenses in your smartphone, for example. But Definitely in anything where you have interested in a single wavelength, I think that these metasurfaces are very interesting. So in, if you have some like optical sensors for, that rely on a single wavelength, so that's like autonomous cars, like Internet of Things, um, that is a very good application for these. So definitely customize sensors. Um, but if you were to able to integrate these metasurfaces into volumes, I think that is one straightforward pathway uh, to actually solving all of these problems. Uh, that including like angular aberrations, uh, chromatic aberrations, and uh, efficiency, but maybe not efficiency problems. <laughs>
But efficiency problems are lessened when you are not forced to solve all these problems in a single surface. And I think it's important to note that conventional optics doesn't solve these problems in a single element either. And it's like, if we want a really high performance optical system, we have to have a lot of different el optical elements in it. And it's not a fundamentally different problem that the metasurfaces have. It seems different in the sense that it, you, it would be hard to stack these things. Yeah. It, like the efficiency would go down as you stack more and more of these. And, it goes down a little bit as you stack more and more lenses, but it doesn't go down a, a lot, right? It doesn't go down that much, right. Um, so one problem with efficiency is um, when we're creating high numerical aperture lenses, we have these very high phase gradients, and that causes some it, uh, problems with efficiency. But like with a conventional lens, if we wanted to have a small focal length, we could have uh, one focal length lens of f1 and, add, and stack another f2 on top of it, and that's how we get our next focal length without actually having to implement all of these extra phase, gradings, uh, phase gradients. And that's another way that we can also use these dispersion engineering techniques, right? Now, if we have one corrected lens at f1, another corrected lens at f2, we can make our next focal length. And that's something that would be interesting for them. So, so the LC uh, PC line, um, device is like they're nine, over 99% efficient for one-handed polarization. What kind of efficiency do you think is possible um, with uh, these types of, uh, not just yours, but everybody's um, you know, structures? In a single layer, efficiencies of around 70 to 80% have been shown for metasurface lenses. Um, at one wavelength? At one wavelength. Um, but I, it's important to note that even these helical properties are also diffractive lenses. And if you have 100% efficiency at one polarization, uh, in these applications where you have unpolarized light, you have that immediately, right? And in addition, these elements likely also display chromatic aberrations because this geometric phase is also. Yes. So these are. It's not like this helical thing solves everything, but it is interesting that they yeah, can do this. Well, I guess what I'm, I'm hoping is that is, is there a path to making these devices 99% efficient? Because then we can stack them and incorporate them. In mm -hmm. Yes, I, re I really do think so. Okay. So what, what would it take to to get there? I think. Um, Conventional, the, these conventional metasurface elements have all been fabricated using clean rooms that are uh, university clean rooms. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, if you look at the devices that we generally make. Uh, it's just lack of precision in the uh, that, I think structures. that's a big part of it. We experience a lot of overetching and underetching. Um, so I won't bring up my nanoscribe, but particularly in the case of, uh, where is it? Like this lens right here, you can see there's obviously defects where dust particles have come in. I was going to ask about it. Yeah, so, not so, okay. so it's not, <laughs> we're not, I'm not very good at fabrication. Um, this was actually, it wasn't work that I was experimentally involved with or fabric, I didn't fabricate these. But it's like a big issue with fabrication is that our clean rooms are not very reliable. And that's like the catch all response that we always give um, is that we, we overetch our pillars, we don't, our structures aren't actually what we want them to be. Um, another, idea, another option is that we actually, when we design these using the forward design method, we don't actually uh, account, account for the coupling between these pillars. Oh. So what we've done right, is we've simulated these pillars in an infinitely periodic array, and then we take one out and we plug it in somewhere. And it's surrounded by maybe things that look kind of similar or s maybe drastically not similar, right. like in, so in this case, right? Designing it to say that the pillar and surrounding pillar should coordinate in a certain way right. so that light doesn't scatter around in right. various directions. And that's something that inverse design has actually shown that it's capable of helping us. Because now if we can, we can actually account for all these couplings that happen. Um, one of the things that these authors in particular, the bottom, they complain about is that they are not able to accurately characterize all of the couplings between these pillars. And you can see that they're really dense. And it doesn't really make sense to consider them independent. So I think there's also a very big design factor that is important when you're con considering like how efficient these things are. So you, you'd have to do a, a more rigorous inverse design, and you'd have to get fabrication totally nailed, and then maybe you could get. So in simulation, have you gotten close to 100 percent? In simulation, we've gotten up to like 80 or 90 percent. Okay. But that was simulations, not this stuff, right? The the that sphere was, scattering simulation. That, that was in the full wave FDTD simulation. Of so what? Of what kind of structure? Some kind of lens. Okay. And it's a relative, not a very high numerical aperture lens. 
But I, I'm asking, was it exotic shapes like these pillars here? No, it was just dumb circular pillars. Okay, that's what I was asking. So, so I think to take uh, his question in a different direction, I mean, he's asking more about you know generalized imaging optics for multiple wavelengths and stuff. But I mean, metasurfaces have a few unique properties, right? Where they're definitely um, they definitely might be well suited to very specific applications, right? I mean, things that you need something that's very thin or something that's very light or something uh, where you can define an arbitrary. Uh, optical wavefront, or you know these sorts of things. So, what sort of applications do you see there, where you know there might be more low-hanging fruit for metasurfaces, where uh, a traditional or optical system might not fit well for for you know, what they have now? So, one thing that maybe is not a frame. Uh, so, biological imaging is one thing that we've always been very interested in. Okay. Is if we have these very thin optical elements and we can implement, we can put it on some kind of optical fiber. Okay. We can now actually, if we attach this, we can in at least increase the collection efficiency of our fiber and maybe increase its numerical aperture. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing is really interesting for us. That's pretty low lying fruit. Mm -hmm. um, and these kinds of sensors, there are already uh, certain sensors that use these kinds of diffractical opti optical elements. And in that sense, um, maybe it's not as plug and play or is not as useful currently, but that's something that could be of use. Um, there's been a lot of interest in like roll to roll printing of metasurfaces recently, and then you could maybe see some kind of like polymer based metasurfaces where if you could actually get the resolution required for these roll to roll methods to work, you could print out these rolls of metasurfaces and maybe on a solar panel to like get uniformity on your solar cell. Mm -hmm. Or um, in the case of like these gallium arsenide solar cells, maybe like a really high NA metasurface that's fairly efficient can focus light onto a, one of these small gallium arsenide photocells. Um, metasurfaces have been sent to space. Mm -hmm. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, to do what? I'm not really sure. It's like. It's related later. <laughs> Simply well, just lost them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, how long does the, the inverse design process take? And uh, so is it parallelizable? And uh, what do you think the prospects are? Since we're a bunch of computer scientists here, right? or a lot of us are computer scientists, what do you think the prospects are for coming up with better optimization algorithms and improving efficiency that way? Uh, so that's a really good question. Uh, this particular simulation took around one day on our workstation computer, and that's like one of the new AMD 16, 12 core processors, and uh, it's GPU accelerated, or the matrix vector multiplication is GPU accelerated with some kind of NVIDIA, I think it's a Titan XP. Um, and so this took around a day, uh, and that was rigorously simulating all of these uh, spheres together. Uh, one way to get this better was actually something we've been thinking about is instead of simulating the entire structure, we know that we, these, like, this, the cup, so when we simulate these entire spheres together, the entire structure together, we get a, the accurate result. But um, if we wanted to cut some corners, one thing that we can consider doing is actually splitting this into different simulation regions. So we can simulate these small sections of this, and that's easily parallelizable. You can simulate large se um, sections of these. And that actually reduces the time that it takes for your iterative solver to. That would very much be like FMM methods, right? Best multiple? Yes. Yeah. Because it's kind of, you. if this is 2D, roughly, are the yeah. spheres stacked beneath each other at all? No. No. So then, then it's like a quad tree. You go in a quad tree, like subdividing this into four sections and so on. I don't, yeah. So I think you would actually want to have some overlapping. So like some maybe some kind of window that has some kind of constant Yeah, change. actually, FMM would do full interactions between them, so you're not isolating them at all. Okay. It's just a way of organizing the compute so that you go in a multiple series, right? So the guy on the upper left corner yeah. will have a low order sort of angular interaction, like you have a lower and lower order angular resolution right. in the how you represent the interaction between them. And so, so do you ignore that interaction or do you still... No, the it? interaction is included, but it's just it's just, uh, that's the central idea of FMM, that you can actually do n cross n interactions, but in a sort of n log n sort of uh, uh, compute, okay. while respecting, say, double precision, or you specify the precision, 
okay. and it will do it respecting that precision. So I think this you have your analytic solutions for each sphere that you want to use, mm -hmm. but you could import FMM-like ideas into this because you're also doing single frequency, and that's natively where FMM was designed. Right. So there's definitely room to use those ideas for what you want here. Right. I don't know much about FMM, but I do know that the authors of the paper that uh, of the Sellies were thinking about it, and they uh -huh. were talking about it in their GitHub chat, and I was yeah. like, okay, cool. Right, because I'm imagining if it's taking a day, then a lot of your work is going into this dense matrix of interactions between all of these guys. Right. right? Which is why you were proposing, like, tidifying it right. and ignoring some interactions. But FMM would give you actually good results without ignoring those interactions. Is FMM easily parallelizable? People have, yeah, people have been working on that for a while. Okay. It, it boils down to a sparse matrix vector multiplication, but that's when you use BEM as the foundation. You start with a boundary element formulation mm -hmm. and then apply FMM ideas, right. but you would start with analytic solutions and then apply FMM ideas, but I think they still apply. Okay. Because it's all based on multiple series of the wave equation and all that business, right. which would still apply to you. So there's also, this is all non-convex optimization, so I've been using LBFGS just because it doesn't give me oscillations and mm -hmm. That's fine for me for now, Where but there's uh, it's a quasi Newton method. It's like um, so you can do gradient descent, which is just go in the direction of your gradient. LBFGS stores the history of the gradient descents and it approximates your second derivative. So oh, if you're okay. really close to your minimum, you go faster. But that and it also has some like uh, what is it called trust region method, so that you don't your figure of merit never increases if you're trying to minimize. So it has like an adjustable step size that it does automatically. Um, there's other update methods that people have been thinking. Um, I use Nesterov's gradient for a little while, and I've done. There's some people that have told us to use like some stochastic method. Um, one way that's like maybe a little far off, but I went to a D-Wave talk recently, and they were talking about optimization. I was like, hey, maybe I could think about how D-Wave could help, and that's something I've been kind of interested in is like using D-Wave. They do annealing, right? Yeah. Okay, sorry, D wave is a uh, similar annealing, right? Yeah, yeah quantum it's, simulated annealing. Yeah, it's, it's a bit what they use in holograph. That's, that's what I was going to ask is how nonlinear is this? So if you if you take one one ball out of this system, uh -huh. can you easily subtract its contribution to your reconstruction, to your far field? Or once you take a ball, you have to calculate the whole thing again? So if I take a single sphere out of this matrix, then it needs to be uh, the system of equations that I'm solving has changed, so and I need to calculate it again. Okay. Yes. Well, it's global optimization, right? That's the yeah. That's the philosophy, anyway. No, because with holograph, everything's linear, so you can say I'm I'm flipping one pixel. Yeah. So I'm just calculating the contribution of that pixel. But that, that's kind of the, that's I, what well, you were saying earlier, right? That with forward modeling, that's sort of the built-in assumption. Yeah. And the idea of this approach to things is well, to not ignore all that. And this is still a linear system. It's just highly coupled. And maybe yeah. if there was a way that you could resolve the coupling somehow, I, that's something I have, that's interesting. I never thought about it that way. Is it possible that um, you can get something out of, and instead of like, uh, I assume these are all on a transparent, Substrate. Uh, these are simulated in space. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they're simulated in space. What I was wondering is, is it possible that you could use uh, hemispheres on a metallic uh, backplane and, and use it for reflection? Uh, right. So isn't that the same as what I'm doing? Well, it could be, and it could be easier to fabricate. It could be more efficient. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Um, so I can't actually simulate um, flat boundaries. Um, this code doesn't actually support that. So I, in, in general, well, you could just um, say it's a perfect mirror. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I could simulate some like reflection of this pillar set. Um, yeah, that's totally. And I, I had a more general question building on that. Have people looked at like all this is for refractive uh, materials, right? Have people look at me, looked at reflective metasurfaces? Are there any uses for that, like making a nice mirror with sub-wavelength features 
Yes. Which so does something cool for you? The original chromatic aberration paper um, that used dispersion engineering actually used a reflective mirror because that's actually a easy, really easy way to double your phi. Because now your light travels one way and it comes right back out, and that's one way that you could double the phase compensation and not have a very high thickness. Uh -huh. um, there's been other interesting ideas. Um, one of the cool things that's come out recently is it's a spin-preserving mirror. So normally when you have right-hand circular light and it reflects off, it becomes left. But they have it, so it's, they've made a mirror such that it's right-hand circularly polarized and it reflects back right. And it doesn't reflect left or something. I'm not sure about what it does to left. Interesting. Now with the uh, area of LC materials. OK. Or something similar, anyway. Maybe not exactly that. So where is the, where is the emphasis in the field now? Is it on uh, better computational methods? Is it on better materials? I mean, where, where do people see the biggest possible improvement coming from? Uh, so I think more recently, there's been a lot of work towards system-level metasurfaces, so like these retroreflectors, these um, uh, angle co compensating things. Uh, right now, that's kind of a harder problem, and then like these tunable systems. Uh, there is a significant push towards inverse design, and that's part of the push that I'm part of. Uh, I don't think that many people are exploring computational imaging paired with metasurfaces because there hasn't been very much research that's been done with these. Um, but that's very much one of the emphasis, one of the major emphasis of our lab, is that we really want to pair this computational imaging technique with uh, these metasurfaces and do this co-optimization. Um, in addition, like there's a lot more like. There's a lot of interesting ideas in nonlinear optics. So these metasurfaces, if you choose some kind of nonlinear material, you can achieve some kind of phase matching condition. And people have shown that you can get some high uh, nonlinear enhancements with these metasurfaces. Um, there's some really cool work doing engineered disorder. But I think it's more moving towards the system level integrations and like these, like the vertical stacking. And I think it's actually moving towards volume optics. But maybe kind of slowly, and in addition to these inverse design methods. Yeah. You're graduating, right? So who, so if, for example, I'm interested in collaboration, who should I talk to? Uh, Arkham Machindar. Okay. Uh, or uh, the other two people that are very much at the top of the list are Andre Farone at Caltech, or Ferry Own at Caltech, and Federico Capasso at Harvard. Um, if you're interested in metallic metasurfaces, which I didn't talk about at all, uh, Vladimir Shalev at Purdue. Is really interesting. Um, both, and then there's also Boltaseva, Alexandra Boltaseva there. Um, Naomi Halaz at Duke does some like interesting plasmonic stuff. Uh, there's that group, this group in China, that recently made this. Uh, there's a lot of universities on this list, uh, mostly in Taiwan and Nanjing. So. I guess this guy too, Nan Fang Yu. He's in Columbia doing this kind of stuff. I think he mostly works more in infrared optics right now and not as much invisible. We're going to try to get Arca here later in the summer, so make sure we'll keep you posted on that. Okay, well, I think um, that's it. There's no more questions. Um, thank you very much. That was a really uh, very uh, detailed and helpful for us to understand a lot of these issues. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, yeah, very much.